Yeah. It's like the trashiest like city that they're going to. <laughs> My roommate and I, when it first came out, um, I was down in DC for grad school. So we got PBR pounders and like fried chicken. And we just had like the biggest white trash night. That, that was a surprisingly good Friday night. I hate to admit. So last class we stopped with um, the law of diminishing marginal benefits. Um, the example I gave was pizza. The first slice is awesome, but at a certain point, you're gonna have so much pizza, you're gonna be so full, that it's actually making you worse off. That's the idea is eventually, your, the, the marginal benefit from, I don't know, the next unit of any product is gonna be less and less valuable <coughs> and eventually turn negative. All right, so the fourth guy post economic thinking, um, which we started going through last class, this one is that incentives matter. This is probably the most important concept you'll learn in this course. Hopefully you'll learn it. Um, luckily it's early enough in class you guys aren't asleep yet, so you can remember this. Um, it's incentives that drive human action, that help determine uh, what people are going to do. So you can think of this, it's, it's fairly intuitive. When the cost of an activity rises, we do less of it. So if, it's, if the price of gasoline goes up, we're going to buy less gas, we're gonna drive less often. But remember, costs aren't just um, like the actual dollars and cents that you pay for stuff. Um, say there's social pressure to save gas. People are becoming more conscious about the environment. Um, so um, I guess driving more is more costly in terms of people look down on you or people will make fun of you. Well, whatever. If cost, if that sort of cost increases, we'll still see people, excuse me, doing less driving <coughs> and buying less gas. Likewise, when the cost of an activity falls, we're going to do it more, because obviously it now costs relatively less than it did before. You can do more of it and still, you know, without having to spend more. It's the same for benefit. As the benefit increases of doing something you're going to do more of it. Um, so sticking with the gasoline example, say like buying a hybrid. If the price of gasoline increases, so fuel efficiency becomes more important, you'll be more likely to buy a hybrid. Likewise, if it becomes more socially accepted and encouraged to buy a hybrid, you'll be more likely to buy a hybrid. Or someone will be more likely to buy a hybrid. And if the benefit of an action decreases, you're going to do less of it uh, compared to before. Yeah. So a few examples, if you increase the cost of milk, fewer people are gonna buy milk. Uh, if you increase the cost of operating a soup kitchen, so like, you know, like charity, you're gonna see fewer soup kitchens. Um, that's important to remember if you wanna talk about, oh, we need to make sure you need to like regulate soup kitchens that they comply with this, this, and this. If you increase the cost too much, you're gonna see fewer soup kitchens. So there's the trade-off. Um, another thing, rainy weather. So increasing the cost of having to be annoyed in traffic um, because everyone drives worse in poor weather for some reason. Um, that's, that reduces voting. That's been shown statistically that people don't turn out and vote when it's rainy. So this is an example the textbook gives. Um, obesity is rising in America, it's been rising for a long time, and there's a lot of reasons. Um, they ask, is one of those reasons for the rise of obesity um, health insurance? What do you guys think? There's a lot more health insurance. Health insurance coverage is a lot more comprehensive than it used to be in the past. Um, I think back in like the 50s, like something like five or 10% of jobs offered um, insurance, health insurance is a benefit. Now it's an overwhelming majority of jobs that offer health insurance as a benefit. Mm -hmm. So we've seen them both increase in tandem. Do you think there's a link between the two or it's just two random things going on? Sort of probably, but I don't know. Fast food also, like, you don't want to because it's so cheap to eat like crap. 
it, it's so easy to, yeah. and it's designed to like taste good for our taste buds. Obviously, there's a lot of things going on. I don't want to ask the question: Is the is the like the only cause or the main cause health insurance? Because we found pretty much across the world, as countries become more rich, they get fatter because they're able to. Does anyone anyone think there's a link? Could anyone explain a link, or do you think it's just two random things going on? I say that without health insurance, that's, I would say that's just kind of random. I think with more behavioral influence and just having actual health insurance, regardless if we have health insurance, people are going to act the way they do. Okay. Anyone else with an idea? All right. So think of this in terms of incentives. People with health insurance have less of an incentive to stay healthy than people without health insurance. Because now you have some coverage to take care of you. It's relatively less expensive. You're paying less money out of pocket if you have these health complications that come all, I don't know, that, that go along with being obese. <coughs> so if you hold constant, the other factors that would impact obesity, things like age, gender, income, um, I don't know the study they're citing. I'm assuming they put in things like exercise and how sedentary your lifestyle is. Um, but it shows that people with health insurance are more likely to be obese. So they're responding to incentives rationally, as we would expect. It's less costly to be obese, so you're more likely to be. Um, so another example with insurance, how about um, car accidents. What's the best way to reduce car accidents? Or to make people drive more safely? I can say you're rid of cars. <laughs> <laughs> All right, not where I was going, but yes. <laughs> if you get rid of cars, you can't have car accidents. There we go. So increase the cost of getting an accident by getting rid of insurance. All right. That's right. That is one method. There's more than one answer to this. Not drive like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you encourage people to not drive like an idiot? Yeah. Things like that at a certain age making people retake the driver's test. Okay. So you're you're ensuring that they're still. I don't know, that they still can drive decently. And it does add sort of a cost that you have to try to be a good driver. Um, like those insurance companies do where they like, lower your rates for good driving. Uh, same thing? All right. Uh, Gordon Tollock had a very interesting idea that I also think, like getting rid of all cars, would reduce it to almost zero. He said to put a giant spike on a steering wheel, point it right at, your, at the driver's chest. The slightest fender bender, and you're getting, it's going through your chest. That's, that's a way to increase the cost. At the time, this was back, um, I don't know if you guys remember, I uh, almost said Ross Pro. who's, I'm blanking on the dude's name, Ralph Nader. He lost the 2000 election for um, Al Gore. He got real famous back in the 70s, he wrote this book called um, Unsafe at Any Speed, just talking shit on all the old cars. I don't know if you guys have seen like the old cars from like 60s and 70s, but they had like no seat belts, the front seat was just like a couch. The whole like dashboard is all like chrome and like metal. So people, <laughs> there were no airbags, like they were really dangerous to drive. So he was like real big on consumer safety and so that was, there was a big push in Congress for years to require cars to be more safe. And while this is going on there, it's like saying, you know, you have to put in seat belts, these will save lives. Gordon Tollick, using this idea, said, wait a second. If you want to reduce car accidents, you can't make it safer, make it easier for people to get in car accidents. You've got to make it a lot worse. He wasn't actually suggesting to put a spike on the car. That was just his extreme example. Um, 
the funny thing you guys mentioned about rewarding good driving is when the car insurance companies first came out with those um, things to put in your car to see how safely you drive, they didn't actually do anything. They just made people think they're getting money. Yeah. So two things happened. One, people would drive more safely if they had it in their car. It was like the placebo effect, like they thought it would help them. And only good drivers, or people who thought they were good drivers, would get that. But if you're a bad driver, you don't want like proof in your insurance company that you're a bad driver. All right. The next guidepost is the seen and the unseen. So when we think about what's going to happen, what's the consequences of these actions, there's observable ones and there's unobservable ones. We need to look at not just the first thing that's going to happen, but look at how that's going to impact future decision making. So if you're trying to think through, say, what the impact of a change in policy is going to be on like, people's behavior, you have to ask yourself, what happens next? So one action, one purchase, one price change, any of these things will change people's incentives. Not just in that narrow sense, but it'll change you know, the relative prices of all goods if there's a price change. So it's going to affect a lot more than just that one price change. Remember, when people's incentives change, their actions are going to change. So a policy might have um, good results in the short run for one particular group. It may seem very obvious. But if it changes incentives for other groups and encourages them to act in a way that's costly for society, it lessens the positive effect of that policy. So what we have to do is think through that and weigh those costs and benefits. Maybe, um, I don't know, making college cheaper, or maybe like the government providing subsidized loans, will help low-income people go to college, help them get trained and get better jobs than they would. That's obviously a good thing. But it may have other costs for society, say, um, Research has shown that when the government provides subsidized loans, um, when they like increase subsidized loans they provide, colleges raise the price to like eat up those changes. Something like 80 to 90%. So you just see the cost of college increasing from those. So you're seeing, in general, more student debt. So while you have positive things for one group, you have a negative outcome for another group. So it's important to remember both of those, realize both of those things can happen, and then weigh the costs and benefits. Which are better, which is it better to do it because you know the benefits of the one group is greater than the cost of the other group? Or is the cost does the cost outweigh the benefit? Um, this is where I wanted to talk about the car. Um, so another example is too big to fail. The largest banks in the U.S. financial system are, excuse me, have had an implicit guarantee from the government since the 70s that if they are above a certain size, they're what they call systemically important, and that bank failure would be catastrophic for the economy. So the federal government will come in and bail them out, make sure they remain solvent and remain in business so our economy doesn't collapse. However, having that implicit guarantee the banks are more likely to take risks because they know if they take even more risks, they can earn a higher profit. And if those don't, if it doesn't um, pan out, they're not going to go out of business because they have that guarantee from the government. So in fact, this insurance encourage risky behavior. Um, you see, you know, more stability in the financial system during a crisis it's harder to see the risky behavior that's going on beforehand because of this insurance that's happening. All right. Next, number six, value is subjective. Um, yeah, they have this, the same beauties in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> the value of goods is determined by what each individual wants to give up for it. So for every single individual, um, the value of a good is different. It varies with your preferences. Uh, if somebody really wants, wants a product, they really value it, they'll 
they'll be willing to spend a lot more money on it than someone who doesn't really like it. So very briefly, we'll talk about this a little bit more next class, but um, that's a mistake that says labor is not inherent in goods. The value is not inherent in goods. Um, the classical economists, the original economists, believed in the labor theory of value. Basically, how much money it cost to produce something was how much that thing was worth. So if you sold it for a price greater than the cost of production, that was considered taking advantage of consumers. Even if consumers were more than happy to pay that price because it would cost them more to make it on their own, um, it was still considered, you know, take advantage of them because the value is the cost of creation. Um, an example, uh, I guess a counter example is old coin collections. Uh, does anyone in here care about old coins? Okay, that's good uh, for this example. So there's a few people out there that really love old money, and they're willing to pay a lot more money for it than what it's actually worth. So you have people will buy like 150 year old pennies for like you know 20 bucks, which is which I guess everyone in this room would say is crazy. Like it's not worth that much money. Who cares? Just have an old penny laying around. <coughs> Excuse me. But these people that love old coins value having that, I don't know, piece of history so much, they're willing to pay extra money for it. Uh, here I have a quick YouTube video of one of my George Mason professors talking about subjective value. Economics is that value is subjective. It means value ultimately comes from the human mind. It doesn't inhere in the things that we value. And I want to explain that with uh, some t-shirts that uh, I went out and made. Uh, I went to the mall recently and bought two t-shirts and I bought some iron-ons. And uh, here's one of my t-shirts. It's of a revolutionary who's famous from Cuba, Che Guevara. And another t-shirt of uh, one of my heroes, Milton Friedman. Now these t-shirts uh, cost me about the same amount of time to make the same amount of money. So in terms of what I spent, the resources that went into these t-shirts, it's the same. But you know what? The value of the Che t-shirt is in fact a lot higher to most people than is the value of the Milton Friedman t-shirt. If for some reason Che falls out of favor in the public mind, the value of the Che t-shirt falls. If the value of Milton Friedman's image rises, if people come to really like Milton Friedman, the value of the Friedman t-shirt increases. But the point is, objectively, physically, these t-shirts, this one and this one, are largely identical. The only difference is the, the image on the front. This is a nice thing about subjective value. Our values do differ. Uh, I would not be caught on the street wearing a Che t-shirt because I think he was a scoundrel. Right? I would love to wear a Milton Friedman t-shirt. In fact, I'm eager to wear this for the first time. I value this t-shirt more highly than do other people. And that's one of the beautiful things about understanding subjective value. It's important to understand that the value is not in the thing itself. It doesn't come like the Marxists believe, or even the classical economists believe, from the amount of labor that goes into producing it. Value is not a product of how many other resources went to producing something. Ultimately, things have value only if and only because human beings want those things. The more intensely human beings want those things, the more valuable they are. The classical economists for all of their wonderful discoveries, did not get subjective value. Economists didn't understand subjective value until the middle of the 19th century, when particularly Karl Menger of the Austrian school realized that people pay for things only because they want those things. They don't pay for things that they don't want. And so the value that people have in their minds for the things they buy, that value gets transmitted through money prices into the market prices of the goods and services. One implication of subjective value is that you can't tell me that the fact that I prefer the Milton Friedman t-shirt to the Che Guevara t-shirt means that I'm wrong. It's not your preference, perhaps, but it's my preference. And because you can't read my mind and I can't read your mind, the best you can do is say, well, if I prefer the Friedman t-shirt to the Guevara t-shirt, then, in fact, the Friedman t-shirt, to me, is more valuable. 
If you prefer the Guevara t-shirt to the Friedman t-shirt, then the best I can conclude is that the Guevara t-shirt to you is more valuable than the Friedman t-shirt. Neither of us are right or wrong in some objective sense. Subjective value is just what each of us, how each of us assesses the worth to each of us of each of these t-shirts. That's one of the things that make the economic world go around. We have these different valuations of different things. We express our valuations and how much we're willing to pay. So without the idea of subjective value, mutually beneficial exchange, which we talked about last class, is impossible. Our topic is uh, subjective value and market prices. Uh, one of the insights... Sorry about that. Yeah, so you cannot have mutually beneficial exchange if there isn't subjective value. So if one person doesn't value the one good more than they value the other. Um, in that case, one other party ends up walking away with something of higher value. Uh, you guys understand the idea behind subjective value? Um, yeah, I'm sure most of you wouldn't pay like even a dollar for this tie you don't want it or need to wear one. But I paid, well, I bought the set at thrift store, so it was like 10 bucks. So I was willing to pay a lot more. But both parties in mutually beneficial exchange are made better off because <laughs> of the trade. And I, I know I sound like a broken record right now, but it's important to drive this home early on, to remember this um, as we're going through this course. So voluntary trade can increase the um, the total wealth, the total well-being in an economy, because um, individuals value what they receive more than what they give up. So in essence, both parties are being made better off. So there's a greater amount of, I said wealth here, but really well-being in an economy. And it's going to come into play later on in the course. Okay. Under subjective value, because of subjective value, um, I guess one of the reasons why it was developed was the diamond water paradox, which the classical economists could not solve with um, the labor theory of value. The question was, why do diamonds have a higher exchange rate than water, or higher exchange value than water? When diamonds, I don't know if to use the word mere frippery, well, water is essential to life. We need water to live. Diamonds just look nice, but diamonds cost a lot more money. Remember, no individual is ever in the position of choosing between all the diamonds in the world and all the water in the world. So you don't have to give up water in order to get a diamond. You don't have to like, go without it. Um, this is marginal analysis. We're talking about the next unit. So the next diamond versus the next cup of water. If you're offered the choice between a cup of water and a handful of diamonds, most people would pick the handful of diamonds. Right? But then, would you guys take diamonds or water right now? Right now. <laughs> there you go. Perfect example of subjective value. Yes, because the marginal utility of those particular diamonds is higher than the marginal utility of that particular cup of water. I'm assuming most of us are hydrated in here. Unless someone's Monday night got out of hand. I think we're all pretty hydrated. But not a lot of us have, you know, diamonds that we could use. So the next unit of water is a lot less valuable than the next unit of diamonds for us. I feel like there was something else to say there, but I don't. I think that comes into play later. All right. So next, and this is the final guidepost the economic thinking, is that information is costly. Information helps us make better choices. Um, the more you know about a product, the more lucky you are to make a good choice about it. Um, one, of the thing, one of the reasons why I hate buying stuff online, because you can't actually see, you can't see, I don't know, how big it is. You can't, it's much harder to judge the quality. You basically just have other people's reviews. 
to go off of. Um, but information is expensive to acquire. So you can waste your time pouring through all those reviews on Yelp, trying to figure out which ones are good and actually give you information and which one is someone just complaining they got the wrong meal. I was in San Diego a couple weeks ago. The woman next to me was very upset and she was like yelling at the, at the waitress and the chef because the crispy shrimp wasn't crispy enough. So her review would have, would have been terrible for no reason. The restaurant was awesome. It was expensive, so it takes time to wade through all that. Um, revealing information from, I don't know, from trying to buy something online can take a lot of time and money. So perfect information or complete information, knowing every single thing about like a product or about the choices of your products aren't optimal. It'll take you forever and it'll probably take a lot of money too, or you'd have to give up you know, a lot of time you could be making money in order to get all the information you need. So since information is scarce and it's expensive, uncer uncertainty and information asymmetry is a fact of life. So information asymmetry means that like one party has more knowledge than the other party. So um, if you go to buy a used car, that greasy used car salesman looks like Danny DeVito. He has a lot more knowledge about whether the car is good or a piece of junk than you do. You can only kind of guess and you know, hope he's not trying to, to screw you over with that. And it's through, I don't know, I'll probably, I probably have this later on, but it's through uh, market exchange, through transactions, through dealing with other people that we gain information, that we learn things about products, learn about our own preferences, learn about other people's preferences, um, and learn about the value of these goods. So it's, the market is a, is a process, our participation in the market is a process by which we um, reveal information and learn information. All right, uh, next there's two types of analysis um, that you can use when you know, judging human behavior. Actually, before we get to this, we'll take a quick break. Um, I forgot to last class. I just kind of went off on, on like a roll. But I'll try to break it up in about the middle of class, take a pause, because people can only concentrate, they say, for like 20 minutes at a time. Or that they end up zoning out or, you know, messing around on their phone or whatever, doing something else. So I'll try to break it up with like a video or interaction or something and then take a pause in the middle. So um, what we'll do is I'll have someone on this half of the room ask me a question can be about what we've talked about so far if you don't understand something. It could be a random question about economics that I don't know, you saw in the news you're curious about. It could be something totally unrelated to class. Um, it can be whatever. And then I'll have someone from the other side of the room ask a question. And then we'll jump back into it. So since there's more of you, I'll have you guys start. How was your weekend? <laughs> My weekend was great because I went down to Washington, D.C. Um, one of my friends from undergrad lives down there, so a bunch of us went down. Oh, well, he's doing, he's a PT and he's doing like little rotations for like six like months. It's like a traveling thing. And it's like the very end of his time in D.C., so he went down there to see. It was like restaurant week, so there's like a ton of good food. And it's D.C., so there's a ton of stuff to do. I lived there for like almost two years, so it, it's a lot of fun. Side of the room. Um, so originally, currency was like precious metals. It was like gold and silver, and so it was pretty much each country would have like their own their own like stamps on the currency, but it was, it was generally the same. But over time, um, as nations want control over their currency supply. So one of the ways that like central banks work is that they increase or decrease basically the amount of currency in the system to try to maintain a certain price level. Um, so they do that to influence I guess, unemployment, the unemployment rate, and um, the gross domestic product, or like the amount of 
value of goods and services in the economy. Um, nations like to have that, that sort of control over the domestic economy rather than uh, being influenced a lot more by other countries. Even though there's the annoying difficulty of having like having exchange rates and having to exchange currency if you go to a different country or something. And you guys see the Aaron Hernandez documentary? What do you guys think of it? I had, for, or I didn't realize that he like killed himself so recently. Like I thought this was at least five years ago. And I was like, what is it, 2017? Like a little while ago, but then you realize how recent ago it was. Yeah. I I wish I would have went more into like the stuff he did in Florida. Yeah. They just kind of like glossed over that. I also thought like it was interesting how, like, aside from the documentary itself, I watched a bunch of stuff about like. NFL and former NFL players talking about how they like they shook hands with that dude and it was like gas him up after the game whenever he had already killed like five or like literally like five people. And like they would That's so weird to think about. He went on to play a full NFL season and like nobody knew. Like they're saying in the documentary, like he's like the only player, like obviously like they know about that, like killed someone and then played the next season. Well, besides Ray Lewis. They, 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 they also like Really a lot of people think it's fake. I, I think he was willing to embellish some of the details, but I think in generally, like, he wasn't, like, lying. I kind of agree. It was, <laughs> I saw a meme <laughs> of, like, his dad, the quarterback's dad, of, like, the dinosaur from, like, that old, like, 90s show. <laughs> his dad was so funny. He's, like, this stereotypical, like, Boston guy. Let's jump back into it. So the two types of analysis we can do is positive analysis and normative analysis. So positive analysis is a means end framework. So you're studying what is. Basically, it's looking at the cause and then the effect and trying to understand the process by which one change influences other changes. Um, so as an example, the inflation rate increases when the money supply increases. If there's more money, more dollar bills literally in circulation, you're going to have a higher inflation rate. The cost of goods and services are going to be higher. Um, on the other hand, there's normative judgments. And these are value judgments of whether something is good or bad. Basically, what trying to determine what ought to be. What's What's, I don't know, the good, just scenario? So you're analyzing whether the outcome of an action is preferable to alternatives. So as an example, asking a question, is a higher inflation rate good for US consumers? Um, I forget who calls it this, but the idea is, um, they call it the devil angel test, where your positive analysis is done properly if someone that, you know, pure evil and someone who's like purely good could agree on the cause and effect, the process by which that works, but would have different normative judgments, different like outcomes. Um, so an example of that is David Hume and Adam Smith um, they were two classical economists in like England and Scotland. Um, Adam Smith was, let's say, more pro-religion. David Hume was more anti-religion. Um, so they both wrote about whether like the state should pay Basically, the state should run the churches. 
and they're the ones that you know disperse the funds to pay actually pay the priests and the bishops and all that to maintain the parishes instead of relying on donations from people. Um, Adam Smith said that would be bad. Hume said it would be good. Um, they both agreed it would lower the performance of the of the priests or the pastors, like who's ever running the church, because they didn't have to rely on people's donations. They wouldn't give as good of sermons. I don't know, the services wouldn't be as ornate or as enjoyable for people. So you would end up with um, a less religious nation. Hume, who thought it was a waste of time, said this is a good thing. Smith, who said religion is, nat is like a good thing for people, said that that would be bad to do. So they completely agreed about how the process would work, but they had different opinions on whether the outcome was good or not. Um, a very a similar example was um, was teaching back then, uh, like universities. In Scotland, professors were paid by the students, like directly. Um, so they would try to put on really good, interesting classes to try to get more students in their class, and so students would be willing to pay more money to take their class. Um, the universities in England at the time, and this is, you know, like 15, 1600s. Um, at that point, those universities were being paid out of endowments. So they were being paid by the university, um, regardless of how many students took their class or how like, and students enjoyed their class. So you had people, or the professors in England, would um, not give as good classes, obviously. Um, whereas in, in Scotland, they would um, try to like, teach classes that students would enjoy. Um, they're based, obviously, like two schools of thought, um, whether people like supported or thought it was bad. They both, but they agreed on, on the process by which it worked. Um, some said, yeah, the scholarship system is great because um, professors are really engaging. They're doing like these great classes, trying to get as many students in there as possible. These are all good things. Whereas people that supported the English system said, well, you know, that may be good, but they're lowering the quality by trying to be, I don't know, funnier or more enjoyable to the students. They should just teach the information as it is, not try to dumb it down or try to joke around with them in class. So you've got the two, two groups in agreement of the positive analysis. They just differ on the norm of judgments at the end. In this class, we wanna focus on positive analysis. We wanna understand what's going on in the world and how these things work. Um, the norm of analysis, what we think ought to be isn't something we can use really our tools to do. Um, so really that's up for all of you to decide. So if you look at, I don't know, if we look at like minimum wage laws, and we can all understand how minimum wage laws work, what the effects are for different groups of people. Um, that's the positive analysis part. We can all agree on that. Um, that'll be a good thing. But then for the normative judgment, despite you know, the different costs and benefits, some people being better off, some people being worse off, what should we do? Should we pass any wage law or should we not? That's up for all of us to decide for ourselves based on the costs and benefits and how much we value those things. Um, so now we'll look at economics as coordination, exchange, and as competition. Uh, I posted on Canvas, Buchanan, um, what should economists do? Um, if you read it, congratulations. It's only 10 pages, but it's, it's a pretty advanced piece and it's a little tough to get through. It takes some time, so if you did that, that's the hardest thing you'll have to read in this class or probably any class this year. Um, so, I guess good job, you know, bettering yourself. Um, <coughs> He thought at the time that economics was too focused on what he called the allocation paradigm. So that's um, the focus on the allocation of resources leading to equilibrium. So what you're trying to do is you basically have, have utility functions for the economy as a whole, which is a sum of all the individuals. And you try to maximize utility to make everyone as well off as possible. Make them all as happy as possible. Um, but when you do that, you just you figure out how many of like each good and service we should be producing. There's 
All the gains from trade are exhausted. No person can be made better off in this scenario. Um, so there's really nothing left to study. There's no human choice going on. There's no decision making. You're just, first of all, it assumes too much for the real world that we can actually know all these individuals' utility functions and that we can maximize them in that way. And really, economics becomes an exercise <coughs> in maximization. It can be done by a computer. It's basically um, just optimization in, um, that you would do in a differential equations course. We're losing the study of humans. We're um, trying to understand the decision-making process. And this can be done by an engineering student. This is my friend Glenn, who's an engineering student. Do we really want him, trust him doing this stuff? I don't think so. Let's, let's leave this to the economists to try to understand what humans, how we're making our decisions. The world is full of constant discoveries and advancements that bring us out of this equilibrium um, where we maximize the social utility function of everyone in society. Um, this makes the all allocative paradigm too simplistic. Instead, we need to focus on the exchange paradigm, looking at how individuals get together, how they find value from trading with each other. Individual actions and the process of learning are going on while individuals are taking place or you know, taking a part in the marketplace. Um, Individuals are able to coordinate their many plans, wants, and goals with each other. Now, we all have different wants. We all see our lives going different ways. We want to buy different goods and services in order to be happy. Um, despite all of us wanting totally different things, and we don't have the whole country or the whole city or even this whole classroom sitting down together, deciding what we all want and like working it out, we all do it ad hoc in the moment. <coughs> one product at a time. Um, choice is a human endeavor and is plagued with uncertainty. There's a lot of information that we lack regarding how good the products are going to be or how good the services are, whether it's actually worth what we paid for it. Obviously, if we're buying it, we think it's worth the money, but we don't know that for a fact until we actually get the product or get the service, we use it, and we find out. So economics is about the context within which imperfect people act and interact with each other. It's more than just creating a utility function and trying to maximize, get to the highest point of the utility function and say, okay, whatever products it took to get there, whatever mix, just produce that and then we're done. You can literally just have a computer do that. All right. So when we think of competition, don't think of it like like a football game or like a sporting event or boxing match where it's one person versus another, one wins, one loses. Let's think of it as a discovery process. So people lack knowledge. The competition helps us discover knowledge. So we can determine what goods to produce, what do people want, how to make them, how to price them, which charity you know, satisfies the needs of people, all these different things. So an example of the process is there's an entrepreneur out there has an idea for a new product. He or she sees a group of people that they think want a better product or want a different product that no one's offering right now. So what they do, they create that product, they go and then they try to sell it. If they do a good job meeting consumers' needs, if a lot of people want to buy it, excuse me, then they keep producing that good and they make money. Other firms or other entrepreneurs see that and they say, hey, there's a lot of demand for this type of product. They go out and make it themselves in order to earn a profit as well. Um, once they figure out this new product or this new way to make a product, 
the ones that one entrepreneur does, the market moves in that direction to satisfy those ones that they've now discovered that people have and that they, have, they now have a way to actually provide them. If people don't want the product, it turns out to be a mistake, entrepreneur has to stop producing it and then use those resources to produce something else. So they may make a different product themselves, they may just you know, shut down their business and go work for someone else. But those resources aren't wasted and continue to make a product that people don't want. Uh, once they gain the knowledge through a lack of sales that people don't want that, they use the resources for something else that people want more. Firms don't know ahead of time what products are going to succeed. Uh, it's a discovery process through actually selling it in the market. You can do all the, the product testing ahead of time, but that doesn't really reveal if people are willing to actually pay money for it. <coughs> There's the idea of um, stated preferences versus revealed preferences. Stated preferences are when people say, oh, of course I'll do that. But when it comes down to it, they actually don't do it. So a ton of people say, oh, you know, I'd like to lose weight. Um, that's their stated preference. But then they don't do anything about it. They don't change their lifestyle at all, so they don't actually lose weight. Their revealed preference is that they don't want to lose weight. Um, we see this in all sorts of human decision making. People say it's a great thing to donate to charity, and then they don't. And they say people should donate more to charity. I should donate more to charity. Then they don't donate any more money to charity. Their revealed preference is that they actually don't want to. They don't think it's that important or important enough to increase their contribution. So it can be difficult to rely on like consumer testing groups. Obviously that's some knowledge. It can help firms, but it's not a guarantee that something's gonna work. Only by actually going out in the market can we determine if, if a product actually meets consumer needs. Um, and not only does this process work for new products, the entrepreneurs don't just create new products, they also come up with new ways to create products. So they might have an innovative way to produce things that are cheaper than the previous method. Like the classic example is Henry Ford creating the assembly line. Before they would just have people work on like, a, like small teams like just work to build a car. Well instead, he put it on the assembly line and everyone did like one little part of building a car. It cut down costs, cost, cut, cut down the time of production considerably. So he was able to reduce the cost. This is an entrepreneurial activity, which made cars so cheap that like the people that worked for him could buy cars for the first time, which they weren't able to do before. <coughs> Likewise, how to price, firms realize all the time that they're pricing wrong and change your prices. Um, You go to a store, if they initially price too high, you see the, sh the shelves just full of that product, whatever it is. So they're forced to lower the price in order to get pe more people to buy it. Because it turns out people don't buy, value them as highly as they thought initially. So yeah, there's, you see, for how to produce a product, there's trial and error for the techniques and the materials. Um, When one entrepreneur succeeds, when they find you know, a, a new way to produce a good, others have to adopt their strategy in order to keep up. Um, they can't keep producing the old way that's more expensive or using I don't know, needlessly expensive materials. But, so the market moves in the direction of the most efficient production. So just one entrepreneur, one business succeeding in finding a new way to do something will force others to adopt that sort of strategy. So this helps us use resources more efficiently. So we have, I don't know, it takes less time, less labor, less materials, whatever, to build this new product. We can now use them for something else. So we've now got you know, the same number of, I don't know, cars we initially had, but now we have extra labor, extra resources that we can use to produce other goods. 
So that makes everyone in the economy, the overall economy, better off. All right. I briefly went with a couple slides left um, from the textbook I put in here. Um, there's three general types of economies. First is a centrally planned economy. So you have the government or you have the planning board um, deciding how all the resources are going to be allocated. They're the ones who determines what's going to be, what's going to be produced, how much is going to be produced, uh, what method they should use, and um, how much people should get. Um, example of that is like you know Cuba, the Soviet Union. On the other hand, there's market economies, an economy in which the decisions of the household and the firms interacting in markets are what allocates economic resources. Um, we use in a market economy, we use prices in order to determine the values of goods, whether, like what goods should be used to create or use in the production process for you know, what products. Um, most of what we're going to study is a market economy in this class, obviously, because it's about households and firms, individuals interacting with each other. And there's also a mixed economy. It's an economy where um, most or many of the economic decisions result from the interaction of buyers and sellers. Um, but the government also plays a significant role in the allocation of resources. So they may be in charge of certain industries. Um, they may have strict regulations on private firms dictating what they can do. They may say, you know, certain individuals can't buy certain products. Um, If you have less than, I forget, a certain amount of assets, you are not able to buy derivatives in the United States because they're considered too risky. Um, and one example of the government stepping in, not letting certain consumers buy certain goods. Um, there's various degrees of mixed economies. There's some like the United States, which is, I'd say most economic decisions are based on buyers and sellers, and you have say, some European countries, which have more government control than the United States does. They're more towards the <clears throat> government playing a significant role in the allocation of resources. So market economies tend to be more efficient than centrally planned economies. Um, <coughs> obviously, there's a lot of knowledge that goes into determining what goods and services produce what price to sell them at, what resources to use, those sorts of things. Um, that knowledge is discovered in the market process, and it's hard to recreate that with the central, centrally planned board. Um, market economies produce two types of efficiency. There's productive efficiency, so when goods and services are produced at their lowest possible cost. We'll talk about this later, but because firms have like a hard budget, like they can't lose money, um, they have to try to produce as efficiently as possible. So the market puts pressure on firms to be as efficient as possible. Um, and there's also allocative efficiency. This is where production is in accordance with consumer preferences. So the goods and services are being produced un, um, up until the last unit provides a marginal benefit equal to the marginal cost of producing it. Basically, you've provided as much utility to consumers as possible in the situation. Things are like as best they can possibly, possibly be uh, for cons um, consumer, for individual welfare. So that's allocatively efficient. There's no way to um, increase overall like welfare and happiness by taking resources or whatever from one person moving it to another. You've, you've reached a pinnacle, you've exhausted all gains from exchange. Um, I said earlier, once we discover a new, more efficient um, way to produce goods, we come up with a new good, that moves us out of allocated efficiency. And then we have, as the new firms figure out these new products, how to sell them, more people buy them, we move <clears throat> again towards allocated efficiency. So it's like a goal that we're not in very often, but we're constantly moving towards, and it's constantly increasing. <coughs> So basically, 
the reason why we get this economic efficiency is through voluntary exchange. The buyer and the seller, like I said earlier, they believe they're being made better off by the transaction. So each transaction improves the well-being of both parties, and they're going to continue until there's no more improvement to be made. Yep, and that is it for today. So if you guys have any questions, 